you live in a world that is very telling about what is here. Normally, you would think, well, yes, we emit radio, radar, and all sorts of techno signatures that nearby alien civilizations might see. But that's probably not what they would see. Our emissions from our technology are generally weak and intermittent. Aliens would need to be looking right at us to see us. And only then, they'd need to be fairly close, within 100 light years. But there is a greater problem. What isn't so subtle are the biosignatures of Earth. This planet exhibits strange levels of oxygen and methane that would be a bit hard to explain for anyone looking to be due to anything other than life. They might also see a characteristic red edge in infrared that could only be due to photosynthesizing plant life and other biosignatures. And this has been the case for a very, very long time. Long enough for the entire galaxy, in principle, to know that this world has life. Life itself has already told the galaxy that we are here. So you might ask, is there a way to hide? My guest today has come up with a way, under the right circumstances, where we might. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK project. David Kipping, welcome back to the program. As always, John, it's my pleasure to be here. Now, David, you wrote a paper a while ago about the concept of cloaking Earth, where we could make ourselves invisible to alien civilizations. Could you give us an overview of that? We were kind of originally inspired by a paper that Luke Arnold had written, and he was interested in not really cloaking, but transmitting. He wanted to broadcast the presence of a civilization as clearly as possible. And his idea was that a civilization might choose to build a megastructure that is as artificial in shape as it could possibly be. So he had in mind uh, thin sheets of material that were orbiting very close to the star and they would cast giant shadows as they orbited around. And we would see these very peculiar looking transits. So this idea uh, really caught my attention. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, but I sort of wondered, well, that's a lot of energy to, to build a giant sheet that's the size of Jupiter in terms of area orbiting a star, that would cost a lot of resources. Perhaps it would be easier to use lasers. So we started thinking about this idea, myself and Alex Tichy, my graduate student, and originally we were really thinking about broadcasting. So how could you modify the Earth's transit? Presumably, I mean, the Earth's transit kind of gives us away, right? Whether we like it or not, about 1% of the stars in the universe can see us pass in front of the sun. And this is the most successful way, it's the simplest way, really, of detecting another planet. And so it sort of seems obvious that if there's another intelligent civilization out there, they would know about this method, and they would presumably use it because it's such a straightforward and simple thing to do. You just literally count photons. That's all you have to do. So we, we thought about how we might reveal ourselves as being an artificial civilization by manipulating our transit. So the idea that we had at that point was that during the transit, let's say halfway through the transit, a transit looks like a decrease in brightness. If you kind of imagine in your mind's eye, it really looks like a box. So you have a flat line, the star's just the same brightness, and then suddenly it dips down like a box and gets fainter. And so we sort of imagine maybe in the middle of that box, we shine a light. So the box is a decrease in brightness, and so if you shine a light towards basically the anti-direction of the sun, just the opposite direction to where the sun is, then you would make that box basically increase and go back up again. 
and you could do it almost etch a sketch. So we were sort of imagining like a, on I think it's the Fraser show where they have like the, the etch a sketch of like uh, Seattle, is it? At the beginning, you could kind of do whatever you want. You could really have fun and create all sorts of bizarre shapes. In fact, you could communicate prime numbers or uh, whatever you want uh, using the laser beam. And of course, you could even pulse the laser beam and change the frequency in interesting ways to send a huge amount of information down the beam. And thus, you know, you might use the the distortion as a beacon just to say, hey, we're here. Look, this is not this is not right. Transit shouldn't look like this. And then if you looked more carefully at the laser light, you would see this much more uh, information rich message buried within it. So that was sort of idea. And then as we started to think about it more, we realized, hey, you could actually use this for cloaking if you wanted to. So what if you just turn the laser on with just the right power that it basically removed the, you know, it was the exact opposite decrease in brightness that the Earth caused when it passed in front of the sun. You caused that increase in brightness with your laser. Now, you might say, well, this is crazy. How can you possibly compete with a star? A star produces 10 to the 30 watts of energy. How could you possibly have a laser that bright? But the point is that the sun shines in every direction. It's isotropic. A laser is very confined. It points you know, in a very, very narrow range. And that fact means you, you don't have to be anywhere near as bright as the sun because the light is confined within such a small area. You can actually compete with the sun. And it requires of order of megawatts to do this. So you could you know, feasibly remove the Earth's transit completely just using, I think, I can't remember the exact number we had, I think it was a tens of megawatts of power, not too far off sort of at the sort of lasers we have right now with 1970s technology, you could essentially remove the Earth from view of another civilization. So long as you were mimicking whatever star it is that you're orbiting, right? Right. So you would just simply say, well, this star looks this way from a distance, so we just simply shoot out a laser that looks exactly the same way and poof, you disappear. Right. So the um, this is a good point. So when we first were thinking about it, we just said, let's just use a laser. But then as we started to look into this more carefully, we really, I mean, laser is monochromatic, right? That's usually a laser is monochromatic, which means it's all at one wavelength. And of course, the sun is not monochromatic. It shines at all wavelengths. But then we came across these super continuum lasers, they're called. So they're, they are tunable lasers, which means you can change the frequency. So those, those have existed for a while. You can imagine having a little dial where you can change the frequency of light, which the laser is producing. But these, it's almost like that dial is being someone's messing around with it and just turning it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And by turning it back and forth very quickly, the laser sweeps back and forth so quick that it looks like a continuous spectrum of light, essentially. And so you can reproduce any spectrum you want, including that of the sun. And more interestingly, because you have this ability now to control the spectrum in great detail, what you could do, perhaps more intelligently, is you could say, you know what, there's no point trying to hide the Earth from a transit survey, because even if they don't detect, even if we can hide ourselves from a transit survey, they'll detect the Earth some other way. They'll detect us with the radio velocity method or some other method. A smarter thing to do might be to just mask the signatures of life on the Earth. So one of the ways that we want to look for life right now is to, anyone you know, on other planets, is to smell their atmospheres. We will watch the planets pass in front of the stars. And if that planet has oxygen in its atmosphere, then oxygen likes to absorb light at a very specific wavelength. And so when you look at all of the, look at the transits in different colors, you will see uh, this one particular color, the planet looks bigger because the oxygen really likes to absorb that light. And that would be the way that we could detect oxygen and thus potentially a biosignature. And we could do the opposite because that's an absorption feature, right? It's a decrease in brightness. It's making the plant look bigger. You could do the exact opposite. You can make the plant look, go back the other way and mask that, that oxygen biosignature by having a tunable laser that's tuned just to the oxygen bandpass. And then you could make it look like the earth is here. It has an atmosphere. But it's just a sterile atmosphere. There's nothing interesting uh, here to, to, to worry about. And so they might just move along and say, OK, the Earth is there. We know it's there. It's catalogued, but it's not it's not the place that we can expect to find intelligent life. So in other words, you could make it look like we have a just a carbon dioxide atmosphere and not conducive to 
intelligent life anyway, right? Sure. I mean, if, if I was to guess, I would say probably the smartest thing would be a nitrogen atmosphere. I mean, we already have a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere. Um, and nitrogen is not a potent greenhouse gas. If you, if you used carbon dioxide, then there might be a, um, a question that was raised. Because if the Earth has, an, has a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, it should probably be much hotter than it is. And they could actually tell how hot the Earth is by detecting uh, basically photons coming off it during what's called a, a secondary eclipse. So they could be able to measure the temperature of the Earth. So you'd want to think, think it through carefully. But um, I think just using a, a, a vanilla uh, nitrogen atmosphere would probably be the least interesting <laughs> type of planet for in terms of a life search and so you'd probably just move along nitrogen doesn't really play much of a role in terms of uh, the like the the it's not a biosignature but is it vanilla because we're really the only planet that has a lot of nitrogen right well that's not true i mean uh, neptune's full of nitrogen as well but nitrogen also allows for <laughs> the rise of life so would that be interesting in and of itself so you know you you look at a, an exoplanet and you see all this nitrogen couldn't you conclude that maybe there's gonna be life there i think the earth the earth is always gonna look somewhat interesting just because of where it is and its size it will always appear to be a possibility for life no matter what atmosphere we we project out into the universe um, so you probably can't ever, unless you, you have other, unless you can hide the earth from other detection techniques and that might be possible. Um, when we wrote this paper, some of my colleagues started thinking about that. Um, James Gillishon, I remember was having great conversations with me at Harvard about how we could, he had an idea for how we could hide the earth from a radio velocity survey as well. I don't think he ever published it though, but you know, it's not unreasonable to think that you know, we think we're so smart and advanced, but even with our current technology, we've demonstrated in this paper, it's not that hard to imagine hiding ourselves from our current telescope methods. And so a civilization that was more advanced than us could probably think of ways to hide themselves from all 21st century search techniques or sort of that level of technology. Uh, presumably, eventually, as detection methods get more and more refined, there will be a certain threshold where it becomes ever more difficult to cloak. It's almost like an arms race, right? And you, if you look at like Star Trek or something, they have these kind of arms races where the Romulans will have a cloaking technology in like the, the original series that by the time of Star Trek The Next Generation, they could detect those cloaking technologies no problem. And so the Romulans have an even more sophisticated cloak. So you, could, you can imagine there being levels of how well you do this. And our point was really that we can already imagine ways of doing this. And so we shouldn't be so assured that when we get a null detection, it's not just, it is possible, it is possible that someone's actually living there but just doesn't want to say hello. Uh, something you said just piqued my interest. How could you hide radial vel velocity? Right, that's, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember the details of that, but I think, uh, and also I don't know if James plans to publish this, so I don't really want to scoop him or anything, but he, I think his idea was thinking, I mean, uh, when you talk about radial velocity, you're measuring the spectrum of a star and you're seeing this, the spectrum wobble back and forth. And so if you have the ability to create fake spectra, which a laser really is, then you could modify that spectra in such a way you could broaden the lines, for instance, to such an extent that you basically make, you know, when we look for radio velocity signatures, one of the big problems is sometimes the stars are too active. Their surfaces are too, uh, they move too much. There's too much motion on the surface of the stars. And that motion interferes with the detection of trying to detect the motion of the star itself. And that manifests itself as sort of as a, as a broadening effect in these spectral lines that you're trying to measure. And so, you know, you might imagine a civilization deliberately creating the illusion of broadened lines that would basically hide the signal. So it just looks like a very noisy star where it's not possible to make a precise measurement. So say we detect a civilization in the Milky Way. Should we immediately cloak Earth or would that just <laughs> the idea of a planet changing <laughs> changing radically in, in one moment would defeat the purpose. So should we cloak Earth if we ever detect an exocivilization? Yeah, I try not to I try not to wade into that too much. In in the paper that wasn't really up our, our point was absolutely not to argue that this should be done or, you know, this is a, a recommended course of action by any means. 
it was really just a, a calculation to demonstrate that it could be done. And what you know, usually in nature, what can be done will be done <laughs> eventually. So this is this is why we just sort of a, a, a cautioning that as sophisticated as our tools are becoming, we should always remember that uh, they have limitations. And if you know if you know the rules of the game, you can hack the game. And uh, if they have some uh, estimates as to the methods we are using, which are fairly straightforward, I would say, from a, from a basic physics perspective, it's not that hard to imagine hiding uh, your your planet or your biosphere away from the civilization. So I try not to get into that. I know some, you know, like Stephen Hawking, of course, famously would probably advocate for that. I don't know, but he was, uh, you know, very cautious about, especially the idea of METI, of like messaging extraterrestrial intelligence or active SETI, as it's sometimes called. Now he was very much against that. And uh, he felt that, you know, if we had contact with another intelligent civilization, it would be disastrous because you look at the history of human first contacts between different civilizations and the more advanced civilization usually, you know, is is not so, <laughs> doesn't really care that much about the less advanced civilization and it ends up not ending up too, faring too well for the less advanced civilization. So uh, based off that, he was, he was pretty uh, against uh, any any kind of, he, he would say he was kind of xenophobic, maybe. Um, so there were definitely advocates, perhaps, of of doing so. Uh, I, you know, I I try to, I try to, just sort of leave it as a possibility, and um, let maybe the anthropologists argue about whether it's the right thing to do. So we should be at least cautious and have a very rigorous debate. Should we ask the question? Should we build a giant Arnold Louver? Yeah, <laughs> to announce our presence to the galaxy. Although the, I have to say the the, Ar the Arnold method has an advantage. I mean, when we conceived of this idea, as I said, we were really thinking of it as a broadcasting method, and to me, that still remains the most exciting reason to use this. If you know, we know when Earth-like, you know, say there's some Earth-like planets that we detect in the near future that lie along the ecliptic plane. That's the plane which the Earth orbits the Sun. Those planets will see the Earth transit. And so there's an exciting experiment that we could modify our transit from their perspective. And again, it wouldn't cost a huge amount of energy to do so. And, you know, that would be potentially a very interesting experiment to do. They might be waiting for us to do that before they, you know, send the, the send a reply or send a hello to us. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I'm not advocating that we do that, but it would be an interesting possibility that you could do this. But the downside of our proposal uh, is that you require two civilizations which are alive at the same time, really. I mean, they have to be there listening, looking for transits, doing a transit survey, and we have to be at the level where we can produce laser beam technology. But what if they're a long gone civilization? That, you know, existed a billion years ago and has faded out. Well, in that case, the Arnold proposal is more advantageous because then even once they're, they're done and dusted, those artifacts will remain and they'll persist. And even though there's no one there to talk to anymore, uh, it would still represent a beacon that someone did once live there. Um, but of course, our, our method, if you, even if you pre-programmed an automatic laser beam for, for saying, okay, no problem, I can just keep sending this laser beam for generations after we're done. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated piece of technology, and so it's just going to degrade over time and eventually just stop working, as, as everything does, just due to entropy. Um, the, the shield that Arnold is proposing, this giant sunshade thing, um, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's just a piece of material, it, you know, and that should be much more resistant to the uh, the passage of time and entropy than a sophisticated laser beam technology. So in that sense, there are also advantages to the energetically, it's expensive to set up, but once it's set up, it persists for a very long time. So do you think that it's reasonable to say, reasonable to speculate, tell yourself a story of a civilization that decides to say, we're going to make ourselves obvious because we're going extinct and this actually relates to an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And we're going to tell everyone what not to do. And that might be a likely SETI message. Don't make the mistakes that we did. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, this is the one where they sort of abduct 
the card, right? I think you're thinking of, is it the inner light? Yes, the inner light, yes. I'm pretty sharp on my track, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that's certainly possible. Um, that's a pretty, I mean, I guess in that case, because it's a show, it's a fairly elaborate uh, circumstance that they, they conjure up there. I mean, I was, I've recently been thinking about this and maybe this will become a, a paper at some point or a research idea about the idea of more just a time capsule. I don't know if they'll necessarily have any lessons. Maybe they will about what not to do or what to do. But at a very simple level, if you think about the pyramids, Stonehenge, there's no, there's no real message in them. Uh, you know, there's not, there's no lessons from history. We've really learned, I would say, from studying the pyramids. It's, it's more just an artifact that a civilization once existed, and they really just wanted to preserve some memory of, especially the tombs. You know, where they have their their personal artifacts uh, buried with them. It's really just a memory that they existed, and we we were here. We we were around for a while, and you know, perhaps in the same way civilizations do that they they recognize that this is it it's just us in the galaxy right now but maybe someone else will come along one day and what do we do with the time that we have maybe the best we can hope for in terms of communication is not just to communicate over space but also also to communicate over time and to leave a time capsule for them just to say hey we were here these are some of the pieces of art we created these are some of the things, you know, the way we used to live. And uh, maybe maybe that's what we, wish we would eventually be looking for if we come to the similar realization that perhaps intelligence is indeed very rare. Then it may be that these time capsules are the way which civilizations preserve themselves. Very troubling because if they look at us, they'll be like, they liked wrestling and reality TV. <laughs> David, th David, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure as always. Within all of this is a speculative question. So as long as we know about an inhabited planet, we could in principle cloak ourselves from any eyes that might be there. But if we could cloak Earth, then others could cloak themselves from us. Do we live in a galaxy full of civilizations hiding from each other? John? Yes, Anna? You wouldn't happen to know anything about this empty ice cream container I found in the freezer. You are on a health week. I've been on a health week for a year and a half. Leave my ice cream alone. I'm sorry to say, John, it no longer exists. What? Wait, my ice cream. 